The presenting sponsor of On Education is Participate. Lately, teachers from all over have been working together to find new approaches to provide quality remote education. Participate sister company, Participate Learning, presents United We Teach, a global gathering place for educators to share distance learning resources as we navigate these strange times. For these resources and more, visit participate.com slash on education. Can't not. I just, I, I'm not talking about it, but I'm talking about it. Oh my God. Welcome to On Education, part of the On Podcast Media Network. My name is Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss why accountability and compliance shouldn't be our focus as educators. And our guest this week is innovation consultant, Brianna Hodges. So when is Thanksgiving? It is Is this Thursday. Uh, (laughs) Let me look at the dates here. (laughs) It is the 26th for us. It's always the last Thursday in in November in, so in the United States. It, so so Thanksgiving shifts. is Thursday, and then mm-hmm. Friday is Good Friday. Good Friday? No. Not that Easter. Black Friday. <laughs> Black Friday. They, uh, the, all the deals are out there for the, in the United States. Remember, you yeah. guys have it on Boxing Day or something like that. Depending on your religious bent, the real Good Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I, the good friday about shopping yes yes, yeah. shopping friday hashtag, yes. hashtag hot take yes <laughs> come at me religion let's go um yeah. happy thanksgiving yeah. americans yeah thank you, you so know, much hope you have a great day i guess <laughs> um we enjoy work. your turkey what are you yep. what are you gonna eat what do you what do you eat on thanksgiving we have just went uh shopping for all of our fixins and we already had a turkey that we bought this nice. past week mm-hmm. um and we're gonna do just the traditional stuff uh mashed potatoes stuffing yep. gravy yeah yep. remember we had a discussion like the one of the first on education episodes well at least the first thanksgiving one okay had, we, we we talked about uh canned uh, cranberries. cranberries, yes, and how I love them. That's like my favorite thing, and how my wife yeah. finds it disgusting. Um, <laughs> and and then you know we even had a, I think a little tagline on Twitter. And it had the 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 can of cran- canned cranberry, which I think is just hilarious. Um, so we're gonna do the canned cranberries, and my wife will of course uh, make real cranberry, um, whatever you call it. Uh, yeah. Yes, and. Um, no, it's just the normal stuff. Uh, the the part that I wanted to make sure I brought up, not only thank you so much, everybody, for listening. We're super thankful for all of you guys. Uh, and then hopefully all of you and all of your families are safe. And mm-hmm. I'm super thankful. I was thinking about my family. Um, that's the health of all of my family members, uh, my parents specifically, um, who are thank God, safe um, and haven't gotten sick. And then my in-laws who always come here. And if you know me, you know that my in-laws are are always at my house uh, for every holiday and sometimes just not in the hot holidays. They just, uh, we're very close to them. But this holiday, we decided um, that we were going to make the responsible decision and, and not uh, get together. Um, right. We we did just recently got COVID testing because of a scare that we had as far as with uh, one of my older sons, mm-hmm. um, and we were we tested negative, uh, and they have tested negative. But it's so hard with just any kind of thing. You know, you move, you you're out somewhere, you're doing something, and 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 it's it, it's. It's the best decision we thought, at least right now. Um, and then when we probably will do a quarantine both sides, so they will quarantine and we will quarantine on our end before the the Christmas holiday, um, and then so that we can get together. You know what I mean? So we'll we'll do like a yeah. fourteen day quarantine uh, to make sure that everybody's okay. Our kids are in distance learning right now. I'm at home while working, and so is my wife. Uh, since we're distance learning all the way into mid January, at least right now, or the beginning of January. Um, mm. But again, super thankful for our health. I've gotten some health scares. You've gotten some health scares as far as with you and your family and everything else like that. But we're here. We're healthy. I I was thinking about that uh, today, just about 
um, how grateful I am just that we're all okay. You know, uh, many people, yeah. you know, you, you, you've brought up several different people uh, that we've, we've talked about, you know, off, off air and just different people are, they're not okay. You know, and many people have passed away, obviously, uh, many, many people in the United States have passed away and it wasn't just all older people. And I hate that, that that's the perception and that's unfortunate that that's part of the, whatever, the the message that is being out there as far as you know for some people but it isn't just older people it's many people many kids uh, many people of all ages uh, have had just devastating things happen just with the illness itself but then yeah. many people have passed away too and so uh, a time to sit down and reflect as far, we will be doing that on on thursday and and just talking to our kids too about how grateful we are of all of the things not just the material things that we have which are amazing and i can't believe you know many days i'm just like i can't believe you know i have this car and this beautiful house and all of the things that have been given but also my kids are healthy you know obviously my myself and my wife and then our family um so lots of things to be grateful for and i wanted to make sure that we you know that I set it out here because this is a platform here, and and many people, you know, um, it it's 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 a good reminder for all of us to go. Hey, you know what? Th- some things are really crappy. <laughs> you know, yeah. it sucks to teach in a certain in this way, and it sucks. To, all these things suck, but many things are still we're still very very lucky to have, and and at least I am, and so wanted to make sure I shared that. Yeah, and I echo all of all of that. And yeah. um, I'm actually it, it, you you mentioned it, so I, I'm actually going to put a GoFundMe link in our show notes. Um, I wouldn't call the person um, this is for a, a friend necessarily, but just someone I know, um, and something we've been talking about a little bit off stream. Um, one of the things about content creators that I'm learning is, you know that. Well, if they're not streaming, they're not making money, which mm-hmm. is why someone like Ninja streams for like 16 hours a day, because, yes. you know, it's it's you, every every hour that you're not on air is an hour that you aren't earning an income. Um, and and that is the only place that you can earn an income. And so um, this these these two um, folks, a couple uh, and they they're both content creators and they yeah. both ha- have come down with covid and the 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 um, the female in this 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 couple she um in particular has been struck um incredibly hard like one of the frankly one of the worst cases i've ever heard um she experienced you know basically organ failure um, as it relates to um, related to COVID and had a heart attack. She's 25, mm. right? Had a heart attack. She's um, she's going to have to have a leg amputated because um, it, there's no circulation getting down to her legs uh, because her heart is only working at about 15% capacity. Mm. Um, so not only obviously is this couple you know, going through, you know, the emotional, you know, stress, the trauma of potentially losing each other and and that kind of stuff, but obviously also not capable of earning any income, not having a salary that they can just kind of fall back on. And because they live in the United States of America, also not having health care, no insurance, they are self-employed. So not a good situation. And and listen, uh, there are a lot of people out there and a lot of our audience that aren't in good situations either. So, um, you know, don't feel like me putting a GoFundMe link is me telling you to go, you know, donate anything. But um, I'm feeling incredibly blessed this year, incredibly um, thankful for, um, you know, the year that I've had professionally and personally and kind of other than, you know, the kind of dark cloud of COVID hanging over almost everything. Um, everything else in my life has actually been like, this would be probably the best year of my professional and personal life if it wasn't for COVID, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I, I gave some money to, to, to Stingin and, and his, and his girlfriend. And, um, 
you know, if you're feeling the same as me and, and the same as Glenn in the sense that you, you're feeling like you've had a really great year other than this and you have some extra opportunity to help someone who actually is, is hurting, um, you know, I would encourage you to do that. And maybe this GoFundMe isn't for you. I would encourage you to go look for a place where you can give. Yeah, for sure. Um, if, if you if you have the means to do that, we'll also be, Cheryl and I also will be donating to the Berry Food Bank. Um, we donated a, a couple $400, I think, last year around mm-hmm. this time. And I think we're going to do that again uh, this year as well. Because again, we're, we've had a great year and, yeah. and we want to help uh, folks who have not had such a great year. So again, thankful Thank um, to all of our listening listeners, thankful for everything um, and, and all of the discussion and the community um, that surrounds this podcast and uh, thankful for the, uh, you know, our team, Melissa and Dave and, and Audrey and Diana and, you know, our occasional teammates, you know, Andy mm-hmm. and Claudio, Claudio and anyone else who mm-hmm. anyone else who helps us out when we when we come begging for help in some way. <laughs> um, thank you to all of, of you guys as well. We really appreciate um, everything you do and um, the amazing people that you are. Um, we speaking of community and, yes. and, 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 and conversation, mm-hmm. um, we've we've received some feedback. I listen, <laughs> listen. I'm dying for people to come after me. Um, <laughs> you know, this is the this is the life sustaining conversations that I that I need right now, and and so our our friend Tim Cavey, um, uh, the the great host of the podcast Teachers on Fire, had some thoughts on <laughs> on our on on our conversation about um, Chromebooks versus iPads. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about their conversation? Um, it was a great conversation, uh, a reflection. He actually brought on Brian Carpenter, who is an amazing educator, a very reflective educator who posts uh, after he listens to different uh, educational podcasts, just a reflection of what the episode was and how what it meant to him. Love those uh, takes on Twitter. And he brought him on to this kind of roundtable discussion he has, uh, Tim has on Instagram. And I watched it post the conversation already ha- had it happened. And it was fantastic. Um, it was, it, you know, what was funny is that if you look at our last week's notes, we never were going to dis- debate Chromebook versus iPad. It's just like many things that happen on, on this podcast. We start somewhere, we may end up somewhere else completely um and yeah. and it was great because uh, they had a different lens than i than i have as far as um and and maybe you too i think you said maybe you agreed with me um that ipads were superior to chromebooks and they had a lot of really good points as far as how uh, they thought the opposite that chromebooks uh, are superior in many ways and actually there was a uh, a poll even uh, on Twitter, and many people disagreed with me and you, uh, which is okay. Cool, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and there was uh, some discussion. I mean, I I was just prompting people, you know, talking about keyboards and whatever else it might be. Really, really uh, uh, happy that there's those discussions that people are listening. Number one, and that um, we can have this kind of back and forth, you know, on these on these definitely debatable topics, and and to bring to light at least to for districts to make the most well-informed decision for their specific situation actually that's right. really that's really the ultimate thing there is yep. no best solution the ipad isn't the best solution i'll say that right now for every not district for out there no right and and it's definitely not a something that as we've talked about before also on here uh, that the the Los Angeles school district, uh, one of the biggest school districts in the United disaster. States, you can't just drop something. Doesn't even matter if it's an iPad and drop or it a on, Chromebook on, or, yeah, a Chromebook. or a Chromebook. Yep, or drop it on students and, and the teachers, and just say this is the miracle, whatever you know, like this Go. this thing is Go going change to change the world. Exactly, it's going to do something. <laughs> it it doesn't work that way. No, I totally agree. Doesn't. And it doesn't fit every single situation, even within school districts themselves and even different age groups, I would say different devices are going to fit uh, different places better. 
And it depends obviously on budgets. It depends on how much um, infrastructure you have in place as far as, uh, you know, do you have the people to be able to um, run, you know, a, an Apple network to be able to do the things that it takes to be able to do that? Do you want to go ahead and go down that pathway are the things, you know, the LMS that you use, does it work really well with the device? So mm -hmm. really, in the end, I love these discussions because uh, our directors of technology out there and anybody at our administrators just make really well-informed decisions. You know, really do your research and, and do it locally so you can do the best for your specific situation, your students. Because just like Tim and Brian said, they had some really good points of which I had some really good counterpoints to to their points as far as like whether you choose an iPad or a Chromebook. So yeah. the answer lies somewhere in the middle or somewhere between those things for you, audience member. It almost always does. <laughs> yes. And so it doesn't, you know, because we put together the best, you know, review of iPad versus Chromebook, you know, whatever it might be, whatever we say doesn't always fit what you're your, and many times it doesn't fit your current situation, your students, uh, and many of the decisions that you have to make locally. I just love that the conversations are happening. You know, in this case, between educational podcasters, podcasts on social media, because the more that we do have those things and we bring them to light, man way better decision making. It won't be like Los Angeles to dump a bunch of money into one thing, and and it just be a disaster because the training wasn't there. It's, you know, a lot that it wasn't thought through. It was mm -hmm. a miracle solution. Boom. Nope. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> all that, all that I think that I want, and, and I think we're, that's what we're saying is yeah. I want the conversation. I, I don't, I don't need to win. I like to win, but I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't need to win and I don't need to agree with you. And to be honest, it's it's like some of these debates that happen on Twitter all the time. Like this week it was stickers, oh, or stickers. last week it was <laughs> last week it was stickers. And I'm not going to talk about it. All I'm going to say is is I don't I don't need to win that argument, and and I sleep just fine <laughs> with the idea that there are people that disagree with me. Sure. Um, you know, it's I want to have an inf I want to have an informed conversation that may get passionate, but doesn't get personal. Mm. And that may get, you know, heated even, but doesn't result in hurt feelings. Sure. And, you know, there were people in sides of that conversation that I think had hurt feelings oh, over just time. being just being straight up disagreed with. Yeah. And it's like, I, I can't control that, though. I, you know, I, I will disagree with you and I will make the strongest case that I can possibly make for the reasons why I disagree with you because I think that that is my obligation to the conversation mm -hmm. and to the topic to make the strongest case for my position. In order for you to have a good faith conversation with me, you have to make the strongest case for your position. And to be honest, I am a, I, I've said it a million times, I am a movable object. You just got to make a better argument than I do. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to yes. do. And I don't think that that's unfair. Just bring a stronger opinion than mine about, uh, uh, you know, to, to the table. And I'm all the more willing to hear it. Um, and, and, you know, so I'm super happy that these conversations happen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where we ended up on this great debate, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter. Um, that's not the point. The point is that the conversation actually even happened at all. Uh, because so many times like LA unified, it does not seem like, the proper questions were even asked, um, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you know, uh, about whether it should have just because you can doesn't mean you, you should, should. <laughs> and, and buying a couple hundred thousand iPads, especially in the era of like, we're talking about like the remember, this was like iPad two, I one. Yeah, I've had one or two. Era, I know, right. Yeah. Yep. Just, you know, in, uh, in, hi in hindsight, not the best idea in the entire world, friends. So, no so training. you can, <laughs> and there was very little, if any, PD. So, um, we, you know, we appreciate Tim and Brian yes. coming on, um, coming on their their little their little talk they had on Instagram and 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 carrying on the conversation. And we welcome 
all of, all of that that this this made it into our our twitter dm chat um this ai uh deep fakes no we've talked about deep fakes before on mm-hmm. the on the podcast um i i think that they're unbelievable and we're getting into like very kind of uncanny valley type territory yeah uh, a little bit and um you know one of the one of the scary things about this stuff and i think this is probably not to like take this podcast in a completely dark direction <laughs> but but like the real the real scare of this is someone hacking like television networks as okay so let me give you like the absolutely plausible scenario okay you know we have a you i should say have a president who you know it's capable um, of anything it, <laughs> it, and and at the very moment willing to probably do almost anything to stay in power mm. a- and that means potentially um you know in like the craziest scenario starting a war so someone um hacks you know cnn says this is a statement from the president and says i am launching missiles at iran mm. You know, we have tolerated their whatever long enough. We have declared a full scale attack, but it's a fake. Yeah. But because of the context of the situation and who it is, that's not a completely unplausible scenario. And so now we're in like the like the whole like national security apparatus has to say, no, 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 no. And has to do it within seconds. Like we're talking like within minutes, there has to be a whole machine that goes into work to say this was not the president of the United States. This was a fake. Mm. Um, but like this is how scary this kind of stuff can get into. Um, you, you, we the, hope the that, deep, that, that the world of deep fakes <laughs> is real. We hope that there's <laughs> friggin' things in place for that to actually not happen. <laughs> Let's just say that, right? <laughs> I, yeah, really. Yeah, we really do hope that that's actually the case. But if you guys haven't seen this, we're going to make sure we link it in the show notes. And it is a yeah. New York Times article about basically how sophisticated AI, artificial intelligence, has gotten to basically make fake people. That's I was right. showing this to my wife and my kids, and it is so freaking creepy. I mean, the reason why it's creepy, that's why I'm saying that, is that it's so real. It's you can change anything about anyone and create any fake person. Now, they were talking about plausible scenarios. Like, you can go to these companies, Mike, and you can, like, for your website, you know, you have a specific business. Well, you know, there's some people out there that do, um, uh, uh, professional photography of real people in specific scenarios that fit uh, all these business type scenarios, right? But they're expensive. <laughs> you have to pay them, yeah. you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. What if you just had a machine that just created all of those fake people in all of these different scenarios and they were just a mishmash of real people, but they're <laughs> not real people anymore. And then you decide, okay, I need to make sure that I have a specific gender, uh, a specific race, age, et cetera, and everything else in between. And I need them in this specific scenario. Computer just goes, and it gives you a perfect looking fake person. And if you go through this site, it is a fantastic web article. There's, I just was thinking about how many great offshoots of this is for educational purposes mike uh mm-hmm. a, a discussion just on artificial intelligence you know in, in a in a social studies class uh, a class where like nicole teaches a creative writing course and where you can talk about okay what can we let's take the next step of this in creative writing and and use what is the next step you know basically like we can make fake people you know whatever it might be and and now the artificial intelligence is is uh sophisticated enough to be able to do that, you know, and be able to tell a story. But it's crazy how amazing this is right now. This is not the future stuff. This is, it exists right now. You can go onto their website. You can purchase 1,000 people for like $100. (laughs) 
<laughs> a thousand a thousand fake people for your website or your other it said video games too i could see i guess i could see that interesting um, yeah. So anyway, I I loved it because of the discussions that can be had around that, and then also kind of the creepiness factor of it, and how sophisticated it is. It just at this moment, uh, man, whew, crazy, crazy. <laughs> I don't need to go back like too far, but you know, there were simpler times. I remember them. <laughs> when I, I feel was like a, I re- when I was a kid. <laughs> I feel like the 90s were pretty good for me in some ways so yeah, maybe we yeah. can go back to the 90s a little maybe. bit the music the, the music, music was good, was good. The, the music, music was great was, the, the music, music was, was great, great. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's go uh, let's go back to at least a time when we had good music um it's a bare uh, minimum can we just have can we just have that please please um so so we just had a really good conversation with Brianna Hodges that you're yes. going to hear in a few minutes. Um, and, and you know, a couple articles have come across our, our desks um, kind of, I guess, related a little bit to even what we talked about with Brianna, um, mainly because the word engagement is popping up a lot. And it popped up in this crazy. I'm going to bring it up again, this sticker conversation, too. <laughs> Um, you know, but everyone, every, I, I can't, I can't not, I just, I, I'm not talking about it, but I'm talking about it. Oh my God. I gotta, I gotta stop. Um, but, but, um, our, our friend who we should definitely, I should, I should send him a message and get him back on AJ Giuliani. He's amazing. Um, who is brilliant and, yes. and, and absolutely a, a hilarious guy to hang out with. Um, but just wrote uh, a, a really interesting article. has a really interesting article on this site. We're going to link to it. Uh, learning over compliance, how to shift to engagement online. It seems like exactly what we were talking about a little bit with Brianna, right? Yes. And, and it focuses around, I'm going to pronounce Schlechti. Uh, Schlechty's work basically about levels of engagement, and that's part of the article. But really, the biggest takeaways that I have about this are that it is really easy as educators for us to focus on compliance. And he, he, he states it. Why? Because we've been taught that compliance is a good thing. He bolds that right there in, in, in the article. And we've seen it. We're rewarded for that as employees in our in our lives to comply to specific norms or specific things that we should be doing. Right. And so he writes in an article that compliance is easy to do, it's easy to teach, and it's easy to, to reward. And so, but when we work towards that, towards compliance, we're not ever going to get full engagement. And that's really, there's a great uh, graphic there is describing as far as like what a highly engaged classroom looks like, you know, as far as the different types of, of uh, engagement levels and what a, you know, a well-managed classroom looks like. And then finally the pathological, what they call the pathological classroom. And really what it brought to light for me, Mike, is yeah. it's, it, it, the, the connection I made was with cameras, and we talked about it on the podcast before, as far as right, okay, having, yeah. having your camera on and and making sure that everyone does that is more about compliance than it is about fully engaging your students. Yeah. And that's really the conversation we're trying to have with our educators um, is if your class is truly engaging and we find ways to really bring in the students and, and make the like want to be part of what's happening and and you really bring in student voice and you give them um, great feedback and timely feedback on whatever they're doing. Then they buy into what's happening as far as in class, whether it be in a distance learning environment or in face-to-face or something in between. And it's really difficult and complex in a distance environment, and that's for sure. We know that, and it's hard. And it, and one of the ways that we find some sort of peace, I think, and 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 maybe a win. You would want to call it a win, a quote unquote win, is that we have the students all turn their camera on. And does that equal though 
fully engaged students? Absolutely not. And many teachers will tell you that. Though their cameras were on, that doesn't mean that they were engaged. They were distracted by other things, of course, whatever it might be. That's but right. it's just but it's just like in class. The other part, you know, that that you know, that reminds me of the other things that we've talked about in the past too, though, Mike. Remember the obsession, and it even happened up in Canada with cell phones. It's a compliance right. thing. It's like we want it is. we want our kids to do these certain things, but the reason why is because we feel that if they do that, that this other thing happens, you know, this it equals this other thing. And it's not a fact. It actually doesn't mean at all that there that that's happening. Uh, we talked about dress code. You know, when I was talking about like the dress code policies that they had for me, you know, as an educator or for the students yep. themselves, they do not equal engagement in in the educational process. None of those things are equivalent to each other. But they are things that are easy to look at and to tell whether or not you are complying or not. Is your camera on or off? I can tell that right away off the bat. I can see that. And so it's something I can quickly, you know, assess, I guess. Same thing with the cell phone is out or not there, you know, take it away um, and and dress code. It, these are the types of things that we tend to do in, in educational settings. And I think it's yeah. always like these red herrings. It's like we think we're- we It's absolutely that. a red herring. We made this happen. That's great education. These kids are learning. No, that doesn't mean jack. It doesn't yeah. actually equal at all. It could be that kids are learning and that kids are engaged, but it wasn't because of that policy you had mm-hmm. banning cell phones. You got to give me a freaking break. It's because you had excellent educators that were able to really draw their kids in and be passionate about whatever it is that they're learning about at the school. So anyway, I, I thought what a great article by AJ Giuliani is so timely and it's something that we're going to be sharing with our staff and really discussing and delving into because it's something moving forward that if it's obviously in the distance learning or hybrid environments, but if it's any environment, it's one of those things that we need to, it's like, I wish we could get over, you know, yeah, but it's yeah. always like the next thing that we want to try to ban or whatever it might be. I wrote a I wrote a blog post about compliance as well that yes. I'll, I'll I'll put in the show notes because I was a, I was guilty of this and it's you know when I when I left the classroom I wrote a, a couple blog posts about things that I realized you know after leaving the classroom the things that I had done wrong um, hmm. I, I spent a lot of time reflecting I still think about things all the time and this one I still think about constantly is you know at, at the school that I worked at was a private school we had uniforms high, yep. super high standards super heavy compliance mm. um and you know I am ashamed to admit that I you know I had kids stand outside my class until they were standing in a line quietly waiting to come in because that was a culture at our school yeah. that was a way that we knew Dude, that was a way that we were um, asked to show that students were learning. It was an aspect of learning um, was compliance. And we're conflating, obviously, compliance and learning. Yes. Um, and um, it is a massive regret of mine. And and so, um, you know, I, I really appreciate AJ and his and his article here. And, um, you know, it, it just teachers, you need to think about what you're spending your energies on. Oh, such a good point. And what, what is important right now in particular and what is not and what you are, uh, you know, what m- mountains you want to die on for lack of better words. Right. And I'll tell you, having your kids walk in a straight line is just not worth the time and energy. The emotional investiture that you're going to put into that is not worth it. There is no ROI on walking in a straight line. Mm. And, and your kids, um, you're actually doing harm. I think to your students, when you demand that sort of compliance from them, um, that's not, it's it's just not good and and i would i would really challenge every teacher to think about where your time is spent and what it is best spent on mm-hmm. um and i think you will find that if you take a really hard honest look at the 
energy that you're exerting when it comes to things like classroom management in particular, you will find you're wasting your time on things that don't actually matter at all. Mm. So hopefully people will consider that. And um, we would love to, again, always love to hear what you're thinking. Yes. And, and, you know, go and practice that for a week and come back to us and let us know. There was a, a last article that came up, and I think it's actually kind of related. Um, you know, this, this article in Forbes, Pandemic Opportunity Rethink Education Accountability, another, another article. And this one gives me the chance, this picture that is in the article makes yeah. me think of like the, the whole, it gives me the chance to say Prussian school system. Yes, um, it is. You know, it's, in, it's in, about in my that. bingo card. Um, <laughs> because, because, you know, um, you know, hopefully this is one of those things that we get away from um, yeah. in the future, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, it brings up all of the, the reason why I love this is because it basically summarizes in a really well thought academic way, all the things that we talk about, me and you, as far as the things that piss us off. Ta one of the things talking about test-based accountability, you know, that that's, that was one, of, that's one of the reasons that's a still just so much a part of the, especially the American educational system. We're just so obsessed with testing and it doesn't really, hasn't really done anything for us in the end, except really made some companies very rich and really, yeah. and really taken a lot of the creativity out of our schools and our teachers' hands. It's taken away some of that, um, that's those, that awesome teaching magic and made it very standardized, you know, as far as the learning and the outcomes for the students. The article is fantastic. Just basically talking about, um, I like this part right here. It says the old mission of public education just reminded me of you, Mike, when I, when I took this out, a college or is, it's basically to say you need to go to college or have a career prepper, you know, preparation, but really What's the actual new mission of education? It's something about being a whole learner and to want to continue to learn and grow as a human and as a member of society and contribute. Uh, that is way different than just right. saying your college or career ready. So there's these things that are happening, you know, as far as in the, in the conversations again, that are out there, they can interweave though. And I want to say that is I'm not against college and career readiness that, uh, you know, <laughs> Glenn's not shooting that down, but the hardcore emphasis of that, rather than being great members of a society, contributing members, has led to a lot of things that are not very pretty about our current society right now. I mean, a lot of the things that, that we're currently experiencing is partly due to the way that we've, you know, obsessed about certain things and really not emphasize other things. That's the reason why I, I really loved um, Pete Buttigieg as a, as a presidential candidate, but several of the things that he talked about and, you know, education wasn't brought up a lot as far as in the debates, the Democratic uh, debates, but he brought up one super important thing, which was he had a plan so that uh, graduating kids from high schools would have to do a year of service. Every kid. This is something that happens, I believe, in Israel, except they have to do military service. But he's just said some sort of service mm -hmm. um, after you graduated that – that gave back to your country. So whether mm -hmm. it was Peace Corps or it was the military or something else in between, he had all these different types of avenues. And the reason why is so that we all have a vested interest in this place that we all love and that we want to succeed. And it, without that though, it, you know, without having that, it can create really some weird perceptions of what's you deserve and what you should have and what you shouldn't have, what certain people should have and you don't have. And you really don't have that total appreciation for everything. So this whole thing about this old system that is specific yeah. to college or career prep only, really, no, we want to grow as humans. And, and, and we've talked about too, Mike, on the show about companies, like what do they really want? 
they don't well they you know what they what really want as far yeah. as their their graduates and we've talked about that it was like well they want people that are willing to learn that that have a passion for learning that can grow that can listen that have all of those soft what we call soft skills but really they're just good they're good humans <laughs> they're good in the, people in the- in a Glenn, yeah. in a world where the future is automated and mm. where most manual labor is being done by machines, yes. why the hell are we still grooming factory workers? Mm. Why are we grooming why? factory workers in our classrooms? That is that is what's happening, and we have got to snap out of this nonsense uh, because we live in a world where we do not need factory workers. We no. need creative thinking problem solvers. Yes, and great point. that is that is what our education needs to be. Not a factory producing system of brainless, you know, unoriginal, uncreative, compliant students. Yes. Compliant. There's full circle, buddy. Full circle. <laughs> it's almost like we're professionals. <laughs> Friends, we have a great interview coming up, so stay with us for our conversation with Brianna Hodges. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Our guest this week is Brianna Hodges. Brianna is a future ready instructional coach. She's an education and innovation consultant and one of the many keynote speakers at the upcoming FETC virtual conference. January 26th to the 29th. This is her second time on the podcast. And as the captain of Team Hodges, I couldn't be happier to welcome Brianna back to the pod. Welcome, Brianna Hodges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is such a thrill for me to be welcomed back a second time. I mean, I think that's like a huge accomplishment. So I am excited. um, And I didn't even have to sneak in and like. Right. We did it. We did it all professional like. I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, so, so for people who may not have heard you the first time on the podcast, or for new listeners, um, you and I, we should share the story of our shared experience because it is absolutely hysterical. Um, speaking at LearnFest ATX. Um, so, so why don't you set the stage? Uh, what what was LearnFest ATX? Where was it? It was a couple of years ago, and then we'll we'll talk about the crazy nonsense that we ended up doing. Oh, the things we do for learning, right? So, um, so yes, LearnFest ATX, a, um, a, a learning festival, hence LearnFest, uh, put on by uh, Carl Hooker, um, myself, and uh, lots, of, lots of folks came in together uh, to, uh, to Austin, Texas to discuss um, innovative learning and what does, uh, you know, what, what does learning call for and look like in this day and age? Um, it was the artist formerly known as iPad Palooza, and um, several different iterations that have, have come into it. And so, um, we, you know, with if you've ever done any kind of work with Carl, or if you uh, know him at all, you know that he is kind of a creative genius and, and yeah, likes to push boundaries, sure, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, make sure that you are your safety harnesses are properly secured because it's about to get crazy. And uh, right. yeah, so so Carl and I. Um, worked together. We shared the same office. I think I should have gotten hazard pay for that. Um, but definitely, definitely, uh, you know, had, had, have backstories going into that. Um, you and Carl might have known each other for a while and, uh, and, and it's hard to say no to that man, right? Like he talks you into doing things that you don't necessarily either remember agreeing to or think are a good idea at times. Right. When he asked me, so we did, what's called a dueling keynote. So this is a crazy Carl Hooker idea. This is two people giving a keynote address at the exact same time. And everyone wore headsets that had colors on them. And and one of us was green and one of us was red. And as people switched their feed to listen, to choose who to listen to, their headsets switched colors. So... As you're speaking, you could see people switching their their audio back and forth between the two of us. And we were, I mean, they they really framed it as a competition. So it was you 
against me, God help me. And um, it was it was a, an unforgettable experience, um, you know. And Carl, when he DM'd me about doing it, you know, I thought, you know, this sounds like a really cool opportunity. Um, you know, I, I I adore Brianna, and it would be an honor. To and I and again I you don't say no to Carl generally, and then a few days later, I was like, oh crap, what did I, what did I say yes to? And he started because he starts to send like the emails with like the details, and you're like, oh my god, this is this is a this was a bad idea. Yeah, and it's one of those where, like, if you put yourself into it, right, because it, it does, it sounds really great, like, in theory, until you realize that you're, like, in the gladiator pit now, and everybody's watching you, and you're like, how's this going to work? And like you said, I mean, that competition comes in, right, because you're like, oh, okay, it's not just get up and, and talk and be, you know, energetic or whatever and share your thoughts and your passion. Now it's like... Yeah. And get everyone to pay attention to you. And and there's, you know, that it, it definitely is a really interesting vibe going into it. And especially because I wanted to listen to you and I wanted to, you know, it's like, it's like, wait, 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 I'm missing something and I want to know what's going on. And, and none of us really knew what That's each true. other were talking about. And so yeah. you don't, you don't really, it was very, it was very cage fight kind of, you know, fight club coming into it. And I filled I filled my whole screen full of cartoons just to kind of like I was playing the audience for sure. Like my whole presentation was was full of cartoon images and videos. So I was like, I, I know how to I know how to do this. Um, but man, oh man, it was the most nerve wracking yet rewarding, um, you know, amazing, really cool experience. And I got to do it with you. And and so that uh, that made it even even better. So, you know, captain of Team Hodges right here. And um, and so happy we have that shared experience that every time you come back on the podcast, we can share again and, and laugh for a little bit because it's a lot of fun. It is. I think it's one of those that I, I still would love to um, like do some kind of like psychological analysis of what it's like to be a speaker in that. And I, I told Carl afterwards, I was like, that was awful. And it is because it's one of those pieces where you start to really realize when you get inside your brain of like what all's going on. Because like I said, like I, I, I kind of cocked one of my headsets behind my ear, but then I could hear, but like you can't hear really yourself like you're hearing you know some of the cues that's going on but then you're also hearing your partner um, your, your your comp your competition that's across the stage from you your your eyes are kind of looking up at their stuff but then you're trying to keep in mind what you're talking about and then at the same time you're looking out into the audience and they're switching things back and forth and so then like your brain gets ahead of you you're like well, maybe he's saying something more interesting than I am, or, oh my gosh, did I not make sense? And so like, instead of being a rational person that thinks like, no, they're just listening to, you know, switching back and forth between you, you like have this inner dialogue with yourself of like, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I've lost everybody. I have to do something else in order to get it back. And it's just definitely, a, yeah, it was, but it's a great a, experience. A <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Brianna, in, in the spring, there was a lot of talk about how to teach remotely, how to do distance learning um, well, and how to use different tools and resources and software and, you know, all of these things to do the job. And I'm wondering, because you hear from educators a lot, obviously, your work with Future Ready means you're talking to educators, you're doing probably a lot of online training, a lot of webinars, a lot of con um, conversations with educators. So I'm curious what you're hearing from educators. What advice are you being asked for this fall? And I'm curious if it's any different than what you were talking about and being asked about earlier in the spring. So it's so funny that you say this because I actually just had a conversation like maybe two hours ago with, um, with a high school teacher that I was unpacking this very question. And um, we were talking about how in the spring, it was this response, right? And so many of us have been very clear to make sure that we, um, that we talked about 
just, you know, what happened in the spring was reactive to what was going on. And it was not quote unquote true online learning or, um, you know, it was not uh, properly and appropriately planned ahead of time, right? Like this wasn't um, something that was really, you know, what we would consider quote unquote good um, online or digital pedagogy in order to make sure that we achieve this because nobody really had a, um, had a good plan going into this, that this was going to happen. And so we found ourselves, um, you know, and, and we found ourselves in the situation in the spring where we were really focused on the things that we could do without really having to think. And what do I mean by that? I mean, relationships, right? Like, so all of the teachers, all the educators had found themselves at the end of a school year, you know, really checking in with all of their, their students, checking in with families, making sure, do you have what you need? Um, you know, we saw heroic measures from educators all across the country, all across the world, you know, bringing, feeding families and having, you know, conversations with people through windows to help make sure that they were okay and that their birthdays were celebrated and that their graduations were commemorated and all these different pieces. And so much was, um, you you can really tie that into relationships. Um, That said, as spring, um, you know, turned into summer and we, you know, there there was a lot of conversations um, on both sides of the fence that then say like, well, we're not going to do this again. We'll come back fall, quote unquote, back to normal. Um, And then there were lots of conversations saying like, this is our new normal and this is where we're going to come into it, but we're going to do learning better this time. And um, and, and that came with a lot of pressure um, from all ends of the spectrum from families now all of a sudden that were celebrating educators now suddenly being like, I need you to get back to job, you know, get back to quote unquote work because I have to get back to work. And, um, you know, all those things that, that we were celebrating in the spring suddenly became not enough in the fall. And, um, and, you know, we've seen across the board, um, educators, really struggling with that. I mean, more early retirements than have ever really been seen at a national level, Um, resignations across the board, all these different pieces as people were really trying to come to terms with what this looks like. And um, and and then we kick off, right? We kick off this unknown. um, We don't know when it's going to end. We don't really even know what it's going to look like with with people, um, with, with students kind of opting into certain circumstances, um, either based upon their school's, uh, you know, plan or of their own need or, or, or things like that. And, um, and, and it was very challenging, I think, in the fall because spring definitely gave us um, more of a national response where it was kind of across the board, like schools are closed. This is, you know, the buildings are closed. You don't have a choice. Fall comes along and suddenly it's up to the stu- it's up to the schools, it's up to the individual schools to figure out how to do this. And um, and without much help and without much um, support and resources in order to do that. And, and that leaves this very heavy burden on all of the educators, on all of the families, all of the students to figure out how to do this best. Um, and and you know, we've seen this. That said, I've still seen incredible things come across. And um, you know, where I'm going with all of this is like now, as of, you know, late fall, moving into 2021, it's like within reach, like we can almost see it. And um, one of the pieces that I have seen continually come across is those people that have continued to invest in relationships are the ones that have seen the greatest return on learning. Um, and, and I think it's funny because I was certainly one of those proponents that, that spoke a lot about like, don't mistake what we did in spring for true online learning. And then the more that I started talking about it and the more that I started talking about it, I was literally in the middle of an interview where I went, you know what, we did exactly what we needed to do in the spring. We focused on relationships. And if we didn't focus on relationships, we wouldn't have gotten the results that we got. And Now, the conversation I was having with this high school teacher earlier was so many of us, so many educators 
out of fear for not being able to keep up with the um, with the learning that was going to need to happen right off of the bat in the fall and out of fear for so many people um, were missing uh, it, you know, from instruction in the spring and were already at a, at a deficit, chose to kind of springboard past those relationships. And it's, it's really been a struggle to kind of catch up from that. And so, um, you know, for, I, I guess I kind of summarize all of that to say, it's been really interesting to see the thing that has come up more than anything has been that realization of the power of relationships and what that does for learning, no matter what age we're dealing with. Honestly, I was hoping you'd say that because, I mean, that's the sense that I get, you know, as not a, I mean, I'm not a classroom teacher anymore, but I have lots of friends who still are. And, and, you know, I'm paying attention to what people are talking about on social media. And, and it seems like, it seemed like that was the theme to me. So I was kind of hoping that that was actually playing out, you know, when push comes to shove, because you can talk about it on Twitter every day. And, you know, we talked about relationships all the time, but you know, when you actually go and talk to someone like a future ready and, and you, or you pay for a service or a professional learning coach or something like that, you know, that's, push comes to shove, we really actually do need to talk about relationships. And so that's what I was actually hoping you would say, because I think that I think that you're dead on that. That's what's really important here. Yeah, it's been it's been really interesting to see. I'm sorry, Glenn, to, to say to see okay. the focus, like I said, from elementary all the way to high school and everything in between. Um, move from, and, and, a, and a, it's been really fun. Like I interviewed um, Dr. Amy Fast on, on our Coaching Through Uncertainty podcast. And, and she was one, you know, she's been in her school district for 15 plus years. And she talks about how she thought she knew her kids really, really well. And as a high school principal, um, you know, there's only one school, one high school in her community. It's a large high school, but she still thought like, we know these people really, really well. And then COVID hit. And the summer, this summer, she said that they took, you know, a really strong look at what we need is we really need to make sure that we know these kids and we know these families and we know how to best support them and kind of move them through this. And so they sat down and um, created a schedule and they went to see every one of their 2000 kids and did empathy interviews with every single one of them at a high school level. And it was really cool for me to then like also visit with some people from across the country and talk to an elementary principal who is doing the same thing with all of her incoming kindergartners, all of her ELLs, all of her, you know, of the, we can't understand how to best support them if we don't know who they are. And, um, and I think that that has been that piece that a lot of us have talked about, but like you said, we can talk about it all we want, but this is that opportunity to really transform what that, that relationship looks like. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, uh, it's Hattie's distance learning playbook. He wrote it with uh, Fisher and Fry, and that's been the central topic of all, all of our professional development, um, really around self-care, how we can build relationships truly build relationships and engage our students, not entertain the students, but engage them. So I really, I mean, the empathy circles was a really good example of what I'm about to ask you here, which is, are there specific strategies? I know teachers are listening out there. and We've heard it's first, it's essential to develop those relationships, but many of us are in a distance learning environment right now, or have been the whole entire time. Uh, are there specific strategies that you've found that can break through that distance barrier? And what have you found to be effective? Because there's a lot of talk right now about, um, you know, com compliance, for example, uh, making kids turn their cameras on is one of the hot topics, you know, as far as right now. Um, but we found that that doesn't do anything for the relationship building for sure. And it's really just about compliance more than it is about really truly forming a bond and then buying into what's actually happening in the class. Um, so are there things that you have found like as you as you've gone around like that are specific strategies that are effective to break down that barrier? Yeah, I think it's I think it is really interesting because, um, you know, I, I tend to bristle and not to not, I'm not disparaging their, you know, Hattie and Fisher and Fry's work at all. But I bristle with the word playbook because so often that's like our go to 
reaction, right? Of like, oh, things have changed. Somebody knows how to do this. I'm going to figure out how to do it by reading, you know, or learning from from this one person who's done it. And then it's going to immediately apply to it. And I think that that has been um, the reason why I say that as I bristle is because the thing that has been most effective is remembering the why in all of this, right? And um, and if you don't know why you're teaching it, uh, you can't know why you're teaching unless you know who you're teaching. And you can't figure out how to do it unless you know why and what, right? And, and so much of that, because why is still the central piece. And, um, and the reason why I say that is like, why does the camera, you know, I'm not saying that the camera is not important. I certainly ask a lot of people like anytime I do a um an interactive you know online experience I say I would love to see your smiling faces I know that lots of us are going to be in different situations and I truly understand if you're not comfortable or if you don't feel like you can turn on your camera really quickly but it would be awesome if I could just see your smiling faces today and um and and I go back to my time in the classroom of no one in my classroom ever walked in with a mask over their face no one ever walked in with a, um, you know, a, constru- a piece of construction paper that like I couldn't see around them and vice versa. Like I talk with teachers a lot about this of you have to model. If you're not willing to put your face on camera, your, your students are watching that. Um, the other piece of that, is, and this is the part that's a little bit harder to hear, I think, because we are all in this, um, you know, we're not sure what we're doing. This is different than what we've done before. And we have such pressure to make sure that we are doing things the right way. Like that's, that's kind of the educator creed, right? Like do it the right, like, like do right by kids, do right by learning, do right by others. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot to not mess that up. And, um, and, but what ends up happening is that we are spending so much of our time thinking about, I've got to cover this much content. I've got to do all of this stuff in here that I'm not teaching the same so way even, right? Like so much of what I'm seeing. And I know like we've had these conversations for, for years about how it's not about being the sage on the stage. It's not about standing up and lecturing yet. The fallback that we went to in the fall was, Everybody join into the Zoom, whether, you know, was this concurrent, high flex, synchronous situation. And what does it do? It puts us into 45 minute monologues where our students are not engaged. And um, so what are some things that, you know, okay, great, Hodges, that's fantastic. How, what should I do? Right. And so the thing that, um, that I've really been talking with a lot of people about and trying to keep in mind is um, really thinking through the lens of asynchronous and synchronous, right? But not putting it into the category of that is for online only. So synchronous things that we have in the classroom, whole group conversations, 45 minute, and I'm not even, I shouldn't even say conversations, 45 minute lectures, like one way dialogues are synchronous. Where is the opportunity to have that? And I was having this conversation again, going back to the conversation I had earlier with a high school teacher and, and she was telling me how she's not getting anyone coming in, like her, her virtual students are not coming into their Zooms. And she was like, so I've just stopped. Like, she was like, I record my lesson and I put it up there and they can just grab it whenever. And she was saying it like out of a frustration of like, these kids don't care enough to show up in there. But at the same time, I was like, but if all you're doing is just talking at them for 45 minutes, it doesn't matter when they come, right? Like, so then think about what are those asynchronous things, right? And when we say asynchronous, it means I still have a deadline that's on it. I, it's still valuable content. It means that the kid or the learner gets to be able to shine because they're prepared in that moment to showcase that information, right? So like homework is asynchronous. I I could do it in the classroom while I'm in there, if I'm so inspired and I have that opportunity, or I could do it at home whenever I've had some time to re, you know, rethink the information and do all of that. So I think that's a big part is trying to decide which is which and when is the best time to do that. We know regardless of if we're adults or if they're kids, like we need to chunk this information and do it in like 10 minute lecture 
And then most of it needs to be discussion. Most of it needs to be that in that social conversation, that social, tell me what you know, let me help you out, you know, having that collaboration, all of those pieces that come into it. And so that's why I kind of retracted when I said 45 minute conversation, because it's not a conversation. Right. And um, and I think that that's really, really important to distinguish between those. And then, um, and I'm going to pause and I'm not done, but I want to pause because I want to have this conversation and then not just be me, you know, hop on my soapbox. So so I'm going to come back to some more tips on that, but I want to, I want to let you guys jump in on this. I was just thinking that teachers could learn a lot from YouTubers. Like if they actually just open their mind to what YouTubers, especially pro YouTubers do, which is 15 minute videos really interesting content, good intros, good outros, call to actions. Like seriously, teachers go watch Dan TDM on YouTube. Go watch, you know, some of these other like especially some of these other like really popular gaming YouTubers that really have got this mastered. It's 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 the art of engagement. Yes, yes, and that's I'm so glad that you got that. I was like, come on, come on, come on, Mike, pull it through for me because it is, it's the art of engagement, not entertainment. And I think that's the part that is so, 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 uh, like this is why I love talking to y'all. First off, like I'm just gonna kind of bask in the glow of being around the two of you. Um, but the it is not about putting on a show. It is not, oh my gosh, engagement means that I have to have like lasers and, and um, you know, music intro and all of that kind of stuff. Stick, it's stickers on your face. Stickers on your face. Oh, he, he said it. Oh my God. <laughs> we're we're going to get some emails now. What are you talking about? But um, let's not. <laughs> it's, it is engagement is and, and uh, like, let's let's nerd out for a moment and talk about the brain in all of this, right? Like our brain basically has three major system reactions. Like the first one is about um, attention, right? Like something's got to get our attention and then something's got to process it of like, or, or orient it of like, okay. And then the third one is going to have a, um, like a discussion or a decision around it. Okay. So like if, you know, go to primitive mind here, like you're walking through the forest and all of a sudden you step on a twig, the sound is going to alert you. And you're like, oh, what was that? And then you, you orient, you turn to wherever you heard the sound and then you make a decision based upon what's presented in front of you, right? So like saber tooth tiger versus cuddly kitten, right? Like you're gonna make a decision of like, what do I do next? And so bring that into the classroom and you've got the attention, you know, like you've got this interest part. So teacher comes in and if you're, you know, I was a secondary teacher, so this, you know, but like whatever your, your routine is to kick off instruction at the beginning of the class. So maybe it's like, hey guys, let's get started today. Or maybe it's, you know, a, a clap or some kind of something, but you have, your brain is alerted. Okay, now I'm going to look over and see. And then they have this, you know, decision time. So how you bring in the next sentence is going to decide whether or not that kid is going to pay attention to you. So if it's like, welcome to the Zoom today, we're going to go through, you know, ordinal numbers. Jimmy, turn off your lights, you know, and do all this kind of stuff. Like kids, what is their, what is their decision? Their decision is going to be camera off, mute, go do something else. And so, you know, instead, like you can still be like, you know, do your clap and be like, all right, ordinal numbers. What are, you know, and like just even bringing some energy into your voice is going to hold them for a little bit longer. And and I do think it's important to dispel the myth that our attention spans are getting shorter, right? Like our attention spans are not getting shorter. The challenge is that the competition for our attention is getting stronger. Yeah. And so we've got to up our game because we're competing with a lot of other things out there. And even if you're in that classroom, right? Like 
it doesn't matter. It's the screen is not your competition. The your the attention is the competition. And we've seen it from, you know, again, the beginning of education, right? Like Bobby's sitting there and like eyes are locked in, but he's, you know, definitely not engaged in that content. Um, and then the other part that comes with that is, and I think that some of this comes from our lesson platform or, you know, our lesson planning um, templates where we say like engage and then um, explore and all of that. We have to remember that engage needs to happen repeatedly. And so I want to go back to Mike's like, you know, comparison to YouTube as irritating as it may be. YouTubers like have this continual engagement, right? Where it's like, here's the little thing and then boom, now all of a sudden we have like an ad or now all of a sudden we have like a new change in call card or, hey, by the way, don't forget to subscribe down here. Like you have this like continual ebb and flow that gives you a little bit of break that brings you back in, that gives you a little break. And so, um, you know, remembering that engage needs to happen repeatedly and engage can look like interaction or it can even be like physical movement. So you're in your classroom, you're teaching your high school kids, you know, go back to the, all right, Glenn, you've got the answer. I need you to stand up and tell, you know, stand up before you respond. Like even just something as simple as, you know, changing your body structure to where you're at or, you know, is, is going to engage a different component of your brain to bring you back in a little bit more. And I think we take that for granted when we are face to face. A lot of us have naturally the skills of chunking basically your classroom lessons. So you you do it naturally. You you may not even write it into a lesson plan specifically. And I think that's why many times then you throw this environment, you know, whether it was the high flex you were just describing or this distance learning specifically, just all distance learning, and you go like, What what am I even supposed to do? So then you just revert to the only thing that you know how to do, which is what you just described, which is these long lectures, which are horrible. Um, and they're bad for the teacher side too. They don't replenish the soul. They don't bring you any life. And a lot of people want to leave the profession because they're not getting their cup filled at all. And it's because we can't, it's that adjustment. It's trying to say, okay, you could still do those things. It just, that it looks differently you probably do have to prep it too. I'm sure you've talked to teachers where you're like, you have to really intentionally prep this, like that 12 minute mark, that thing, what you were just describing as far as the YouTubers, Mike, it's very intentional, all of the things, and it's very timed out. So oh that my God, yeah. You, so that you are on rhythm and you make sure you stay on that pacing thing. Naturally, we don't usually have to do that in class. It's kind of like an ebb and flow kind of thing. You can read your audience really easily. And in this environment, you can't do any of those things. So it's like, it, it's a super frustrating, you know, for a lot of teachers until you get proper training or you just get the permission to go, hey, here's ways to do this. And this, it does work this similarly, just looks differently. Yeah, I think I think the permission piece is huge, right? Because I think that there is this like one this this pressure that we put on ourselves of like we don't know. Like you said we do. We do. It might not be a conscious decision, but we really do know. And um and and I love your 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 comment about purposefully being intentional with it and that's one of those pieces that that I encourage people to do is not don't don't do like I did, and um, you know, back in the day, back in the early in the, in the early days of of digital devices coming into the classroom, of you know, googling best way to teach English in a you know with an iPad or or whatever, because you're gonna get the fire hose of information, and um, and it's yeah. not and it's not going to be the best information out there. And does that mean that it's not good information? No, it's absolutely good information but it's information. It's not personalization. So you don't have that. You don't have that experience to be like, Oh, okay. I know we, we put too much focus on that tool or that program or that novel or that song or that, you know, um, test or whatever, because this has worked with somebody. And so therefore, if I, you know, throw this onto my people, it'll work for them too. And, um, and that's, that, that doesn't work that way. But instead, if we like 
group it and we say, okay, here are some, some great ways for interactive polling. And there's like three choices. And then here are some great ways for, um, you know, short response. And we have like two or three choices that are in there. And we kind of pare that down and simplify it down so that it is more, um, natural, I guess, for, for our, our educator mindset of like, okay, yeah, like I'm going to have, you know, some, some debate discussion and this is a real, okay, perfect. Then I can pull this tool in here and, and use that. Um, that's why I'm a huge fan of focusing on the content and on the pedagogy before we start trying to bring some of those other pieces into it. And, um, and I do think, I think that that's the permission side of it because as teachers, they know but they've been convinced that this new environment, like all of a sudden has changed it. I mean, y'all know I'm from Texas and in Texas, we talk about cows looking at a new gate. And so basically what that means is like all of a sudden you bring cows into a pasture and you put a gate in front of them. They're like, what is this? They've never seen it before. They like freak out about it because they don't know what it so is. True. And this is the same thing. Like all of a sudden we have a new gate and, and, and as educators, we're like, we don't, we don't know what to do with this. And it's like, you're going to go through it. You're going to do just like you've always done. It just looks a little bit different. Teaching is still teaching. Learn is still learning. You've just got some different crayons that you're going to use for it. Don't freak out over it. And, um, and I think that, that, that from the self-care stance, we've got to make sure that teachers understand that they have the magic within them to do this. It's not that they're ill-equipped. They have it. They just need to be given the confidence, the reassurance, and the support that they are headed in the right direction. There's teachers doing this well, too. Like I was thinking about, um, I was looking back at my bookshelf. Um, at at uh, at my books to make sure I got the name right, but um, we interviewed a, a, a fellow by the name of Josh Stock um, a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks ago, I guess, and he wrote a whole book on basically teaching using video and and treating your education, your your practice like a YouTube channel. I mean, he wrote the book on this, so go back and listen to that episode, Josh Stock. Um, but I, I absolutely think that, you know, there are some folks doing this and, and, and doing it well. Um, and we have a lot to learn in th this time from those types of folks, for sure. Um, Brianna, FETC is coming up in a, in a few months, and you're going to be delivering one of the keynote presentations. First off, I don't know why this isn't a dueling keynote um, and why we're, not do why we're not doing this together. Come on, Jen Womble, let's go. First off, right. Second, um, can you can you share with us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about uh, during your keynote at FETC? Absolutely. Um, and I would, you know, you've always got a spot. Like you come in next to me, Mike, and we will we will duel it out together. We will we will make oh, this happen. Right. But um, it, you know, a lot of what this conversation will be is really wrapped around what we just most recently talked about on this, which is the um, is, is the empathy of uh, is not only the empathy, but it's also the um, the recognition that comes with empathy. And so what do we mean by that? Of like empathy is what allows us to understand um, or at least appreciate the experiences, the perspectives, the emotions, the challenges, all of these different things of people, of, of, of anyone, any person, animal, different types of situations that are not one that we have ourselves personally experienced. And um, I think that pretty much sums up all of 2020 is a lot of experiences that we've never personally had before. Um, but it's also that that realization that an experience doesn't change effectively who you are. Um, you can't change the experience, but you can change how you are handling the experience and what that and what you learn from that. And, and you know, ultimately, that's really kind of the center of being an educator is that we're always looking for experiences and then what comes from that experience? How does it change us? Does it reinforce things? Does it, um, you know, change our perspective on something? And, and how can we take all of that um, as an educator and, and, you know, improve and reimagine learning as we come into this? And so, um, you know, 
uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be actually doing this keynote with uh, with Tom Murray, and, and you know, both of us are really pretty passionate about authentic, um, you know, conversations and you know, really bringing the personal aspect of learning into learning. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I think, uh, you know, for me personally, a lot of that comes down to story. Um, I've said from day one that uh, if we're after equity, we can't get to equity without empathy. And if we um, are after empathy, the only way to get to empathy is through story. And so we have to have these conversations. We have to have these stories. Um, uh, these exchanges between families, between colleagues, between students, between countries, between, um, you know, all of these different pieces, policymakers and stakeholders, um, you know, we've got to understand what what each other are going through so that way we can best um you know come back with that and and my hope with all of this is that we are not returning um to a state of of normalcy but instead we are reimagining possibilities of of where we're going to be headed well that sounds that sounds great we, we actually have tom on the podcast next week so we'll make sure that you've make sure you've compared notes to your that you're actually are talking about the <laughs> Uh, the same thing. We'll we'll compare it. We'll, about, I don't know what he's going to be talking about. I, I plan on. I mean, you know, maybe what, you, you are know. doing a dueling keynote just with Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, just a reminder, friends. FETC 2021 is a free virtual event this year, and all you have to do is visit fetc.org/register to join the thousands of others who will register to learn with amazing educators like Brianna, um, and you can join Team Hodges with me. Um, again, hef, head to FETC.org slash register for your free pass to FETC 2021. Brianna Hodges, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And I would be remiss if I did not give a huge shout out to FETC because I think it is phenomenal that they have... Um, opened this event for free to all educators and not, um, and, you know, I think that is something I, I hope people take note of. Like that's a huge, huge opportunity. Um, we need learning um, and, and networked learning more now than ever. And I, I think that's a huge, huge props to them for doing that. We'll just keep saying free as often as we can. So people can remember that it's free that you go to the free FETC virtual event. That's free. That's right. That's my favorite F, F, F word. Four letter F word is free right there. Free, 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 <laughs> free, free. Uh, th thanks so much, Brianna. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Glenn Irvin. My co-host is Mike Washburn. On Education is part of the On Podcast Media Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Monica Burns, Mike Matera, Tisha Richmond, and many more by visiting onpodcastmedia.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website, oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is at Mr. Washburn on Twitter, and I can be found on Twitter at Irv Spanish. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at uneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Participate, for supporting us. Check out participate.com to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening, stay awesome, and see you soon.